who's going to really move the needle? I think it's going to be Black Lives Matter. I think it's going to be people protesting in the street. I think it's going to be uprisings that remind politicians and so-called great men that you can't build anything without people. And if the people aren't behind you, then you're nothing. I'm a science journalist who also writes science fiction. I've written a number of books, both fiction and nonfiction, and I'm a contributor to the New York Times and New Scientist. And I also have a podcast called Our Opinions Are Correct, which is about science fiction and society. In both my nonfiction work, where I'm really trying to speculate about the realistic possibilities for the future, but also in my fiction, history provides a map for us, a template for thinking about what could come next. What we have left in the historical record shows us that uh, humanity has been through incredibly dark times, very similar to what we're going through now with environmental changes that seem catastrophic, political changes that feel like they're bringing on the end times, and we have survived through them. And we also get hints about how we survived, you know, what were good strategies. And also we get a sense of which moments are sort of change points, basically. When, when do humans kind of diverge from a history or diverge from a timeline that seems like they were just chugging along? Like, for example, in the West, we love to look at uh, the demise of the Roman Empire and say like, oh my gosh, like that was this time when everything changed. We were right, we were on the verge of inventing computers and then suddenly, you know, the Visigoths, God, those guys. It's interesting to look back at those points and say like, well, what really happened there? Like. Was there really a fall of civilization or was there a transformation, which is obviously much more um, true to what went on. And the loss part, which I feel every day as I'm doing this kind of work, because I write a lot about archeology, span is that we actually just don't fully know what happened. And, and so to the extent that history gives us a guide, it's a very ambiguous guide because we don't have access to the voices of people who were left out of the story, who would have been the majority of people on the planet, you know, working people and slaves and women. And there's that sense of, you know, we've, we've lost this vital part of our history and we're still soldiering on. And so as we look into the future, there's always this kind of echo of mourning for things that we, maybe if we knew them, it would help us solve our predicament. I really think that th there's a there's a big crossover between studying history and studying the future because there's there are always those huge blank spots for different reasons. Four Lost Cities is uh, nonfiction and it's basically an exploration of uh, contemporary archaeology and what contemporary archaeology can tell us about why people abandon cities. And the four cities in the book are all major cities. Like they were uh, either central to trade routes or they were simply enormous. So Cahokia is a city like this. It's in Southern Illinois, right near um, East St. Louis. And at its height, let's say around in the 900s, the city really explodes. It has this big uh, wave of immigration, tons of people come, and they start building these monumental earthen mounds. The largest of them that still remains, which is in the Cahokia Mound State Park, its footprint is about the size of the Great Pyramid at Giza, to give you a sense of how big it is. It's just incredible, and you can climb to the top and see St. Louis. And what's interesting about Cahokia is that it grew huge. Like we think now, or archeologists think now that it stretched probably all the way into St. Louis. And this was a city that grew incredibly fast. And it was about 300 years-ish before people just started abandoning it. The question that archeologists have about this place, I mean, there's many questions because we don't know that much about the culture. They didn't leave any writing behind or anything that we understand as writing. They just left art and toys and games and the street grid. So why did they leave? To answer that question, really what archeologists do is they look at the changing uh, street grid of this city. And what we know is that when the city was at its most populated, it had a very rigid east-west street grid where houses seem to all have been oriented in one direction, uh, which is very typical of, of medieval cities. You see it all over the world. Then something happens, we don't know, and suddenly we have a city that goes for about a hundred years 
off of that street grid. It starts to recreate um, an earlier type of neighborhood around courtyard structures. So kind of circular structures where a bunch of houses are put together. And so it suggests that people were changing their beliefs, changing their relationships with each other. The other thing that's my favorite about this is that the relationship that people had to that huge, what's called Monk's Mound, the biggest of the mounds, which was at the center of the city, people's relationship with it seems to change. Again, based on the archeological record, we see by digging down that, you know, for a very long time, this uh, mound is at the center of the city and there's a huge plaza around it, enormous, and it's very carefully graded and it's kept clean and it's very obviously being used for a lot of different stuff. Suddenly, around the time of this return to the courtyard structure of neighborhood, people start using the plaza as a place to throw their garbage. And why? You know, this could be an aberration in the record. It could be that we're completely misreading things, but it really seems like suddenly people are rejecting this centralized monument. Does it mean they rejected authority? Did they have a coup? The most common explanation is there was some kind of social movement and we can see it written into the street grid. And then slowly over time, after this big transformation, people start to drift away and the neighborhoods become more like villages. And then pretty soon you start seeing people just going to villages that kind of look like the neighborhoods they used to have at Cahokia. And so the city just, by the time Europeans found it, the Cahokia tribe was living there, but they had nothing to do with the people who built it. It's an interesting example, I think, of trying to use urban planning and architecture as a way of understanding what was happening on a broad scale socially in a city. Were they rejecting the city? Were they rejecting politics when they left? We don't know. And it's, it's a loss that we don't know that. Future of Another Timeline is about two groups of time travelers who are trying to change the past. And one group is intersectional feminists uh, who come from a slightly different timeline than ours. This is a world where time travel is ubiquitous. Everyone knows about it. People have been changing the timeline constantly, like ever since, you know, antiquity. The timeline is kind of like a history book. People come in and say like, actually, you remember that women existed? Maybe we should rewrite this textbook to reflect their experience. Or, hey, you know, slaves actually wrote things down. We could include what they had to say. So they're in an edit war, basically, over history, uh, these feminists, and they're fighting against uh, men's rights activists of the future who are pushing for a world where, you know, men are in charge and women are basically, um, mindless baby machines. The way that they frame their debate is that basically the men's rights activists believe that history can only be changed by a few great men, just a few people who are kind of miraculously better than the rest of us and are kind of magically leaders because they really buy into kind of meritocracy where, you know, it just so happens that it's always rich cis white guys that rise to the top. And the feminists believe much more in a view of history as driven by social movements, so collective action. So when they travel back in time and try to change things for the better, what they do is they join social movements. It's a kind of philosophical debate that you see played out all the time in history departments and the newspaper where, you know, there's this question of who has more power? Is it the people marching in the street? Is it Black Lives Matter? Is it Me Too? Or is it Putin or Trump or um, Duterte? You know, which, which of those groups is gonna really be able to change history? And in the book, I try to leave open the possibility that it's really a little bit of both. We have this endless tug of war and right now, in our world, in our timeline <laughs> today, in nonfiction world, I think we're being forcefully and hopefully reminded that we do have power if we if we get together and we form movements and we form groups that can engage in collective action, that it's incredibly powerful. We hopefully are going to see a lot more of that going forward. I think when you're in a time as we are of incredible crisis, where almost everyone's lives have been touched by danger, whether it's pandemic danger or fire danger or flooding. We've seen how 
neglect from our leaders results in suffering. Like it's not just that we're being attacked by nature, we're being attacked by politics. And so any kind of collective action, whether that's just helping your neighbors move their goats from their farm to a safer place or um, working with the fire department or marching in the street for civil rights uh, and police reform, those are all ways that we actually do make a big difference and we're seeing that right now and I think it's easy to forget that like I think we often say like oh if you really want to change things you have to become president or you have to like become a full professor and not just like an assistant professor um, whatever we get hung up on these hierarchies but the power is in banding together and having common cause so that's my hope and that's why I love cities because cities are a great place to band together and to find like-minded people.